of the great things about walking through Scripture is that we get to hit every point. Uh, we get to hit every point of doctrine. We get to hit every point of application that the Scripture gives us. We get to hit every point of methodology that the Scripture gives us. And as we walk through the text, it's really, really difficult to misinterpret the text because one week, you know, the Scripture will cover one thing and the next week it'll cover another thing and it's always related and then eventually we get through the scriptures and you have to cover everything that's there in the scriptures and so if you contradict yourself here when you talked here then uh then the scripture you know calls you out and you have to correct your doctrine so it's really hard to misinterpret scripture really hard to get way off when it comes to the doctrine if we're just walking through scripture um i have heard many many times in my life um, in several different churches uh, that we've been in, several different churches that we visited. And when I just listen to people online, I'll listen to people in our community, you know, and going out, just so I know, because I care about our community. Um, I care about other churches in our community. Um, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I'll, when I can, I'll look up the, the teachings of different pastors in our community and around our community and just so that I'm connected with, you know, across the nation and around the world. And I'll listen to sermons and even within the last uh within the last two weeks i have heard someone say say this about the scriptures and about the law of of god um and they'll say something like since grace is sufficient and since we are saved by grace alone then the law is no longer binding and the law is no longer applicable or valid or the law is abolished or or the law has been done away with that sort of language all you have to do is trust in Jesus and rest in his grace or choose to follow Jesus and trust in his grace um, fall upon his grace it's that sort of language and I hear it all the time and I think the intention is good right the intention is we don't want to be guilty of preaching legalistic religion or works-based religion, but then we go to this other extreme and say well, the law isn't important at all, right? And Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we've already heard Jesus teach. Well, we, we've seen Jesus teach. His disciples heard him teach in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, um, that he did not come to abolish the law. He did not come to do away with the law. And here in this text, Jesus is going to hit the law again. But before we dive into this text, I want to ask, these questions up on the board just for our reflection and uh, we won't answer them right now we'll kind of get to them as we work through uh, the text today but uh one just the main question the overarching question is if we are saved by grace alone is the law still valid why and how would be the questions attached to that the first you know sub question sub subcategory question number two actually has several sub questions under it you know questions that follow but i can't fit all that on the board so i'll just ask them when we get there but number one is uh is the law a burden or a pleasure for you and that's just an introspective question it's you have a problem with that yeah with, with the law and saved by grace etc not sure where to put put them together yeah well tonight Woo, we're gonna we're gonna put those puzzle pieces together tonight. Hopefully, in a way that's understandable. <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. Number two, is every law written on our hearts, and do we strive to obey every single command in the Old Testament? And there are sub several sub questions, you know, under that. But we'll get there. Uh, three, is it possible for God's people to be corrupted if they are surrounded by sinners? You know, you have that verse in uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that says. Um, Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so that's there in the scripture. Um, there's a context to that verse. Um, and he's talking about false teaching. When he's talking about bad company, he's talking about false teachers in 1 Corinthians. This is a different question. This is, is it possible for God's people to be corrupted if they are surrounded by sinners? Um, and so we'll think about that uh, with reference to what Jesus teaches here, with reference to Jesus' action. But would somebody like to read Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 through 13 thank you uh this is a familiar passage of scripture i think for quite a few people this is uh one that that uh the preachers and teachers will often go to it's the calling of matthew and uh people will know we'll take this and and we'll relate it to oh, okay jesus called sinners he ate with sinners 
And so we need to be like Jesus and be around sinners. And I think that's a good application. Um, what else have you heard preached or taught from this passage of Scripture? Um, what stands out to you before we, before we dive in here? We'll look at this passage in three parts. Um, verses 9 and 10. Uh, we'll see that Jesus calls sinners. Uh, Jesus is here to call sinners. In verse 11, we'll see that Jesus does not call the self-righteous. In verses 12 and 13, uh, God actually reveals what his desire is. And so we'll actually see what God's desire is. And so we often like, God, what is your will? God, what do you want? God, what is your desire? Here in this passage, he, he tells us explicitly what his desire is. Is And we'll look back to the Old Testament to see where he has explained that in the Old Testament. But first, verses 9 and 10, Jesus calls sinners. First, we'll look at verse 9. That makes sense, right? Uh, we'll look, start with verse 9 since the passage starts with verse 9. Yeah, I think that makes sense. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew. This is really funny. Matthew refers to himself in the third person. Uh, this is the first time we see Matthew refer to himself in his gospel. And so... Finally, after 34 weeks, this is the 35th week we've been in Matthew's gospel, uh, finally, Matthew, the one who wrote this gospel down, uh, who was inspired to write this gospel down, finally he enters the story. Uh, it's not until chapter 9. He saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he, that's Matthew, got up and followed followed Jesus. Uh, Matthew is sitting in a tax collector's booth. What does this reveal about who Matthew is? So Matthew, he's sitting in this tax collector's booth, and this uh, means that he really wasn't worth much, if anything, from the perspective of his fellow Jews, from the eyes of religious Jews. Jesus um, calls this, public nuisance of a man, Matthew, to follow him. So the Jews, Matthew is a tax collector. We don't like him. He is a sinner. He is unclean before God. He is a public nuisance. He steals our money. He keeps them for himself. He is a thief for Rome and for himself. And Jesus, passing by the tax collector's booth, and this, these are the thoughts that are going through everybody's minds, right? And Jesus, so Matthew, Levi, his name was also Levi. Mm -hmm. Follow me. And Matthew steps out of his tax collector's booth and he follows Jesus. Um, now, this probably doesn't strike us as odd, right? Because uh, we talk often about how Jesus calls the worst of sinners to follow him. Here, here in this text, we just see that Jesus calls sinners. And Jesus is going to confirm this. Uh, this is the, it's a literal, this is a historical event happening but going along with this, Jesus is going to basically use this as an illustration when he gets to verses 12 and 13, where he'll spell out this doctrine explicitly. I came to call sinners. I came to call the unrighteous. And before he gets to that specific teaching, that explicit teaching, he's living it out. He's actually calling the, the worst of sinners in society to, to follow him. Now, this is amazing. And so this equivalent to a public nuisance, Matthew, the tax collector Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, he responds to Jesus calling by getting up and following him. Oh, this rabbi just came to me. I don't I don't deserve to follow a rabbi. I'm I'm breaking apparently I'm breaking the law and I'm unclean according to the ritual law of God. And here's a rabbi, a teacher, someone who's doing miracles, who's now calling me to follow him. Uh, yes, please. You notice Matthew, like the disciples before, he leaves his livelihood behind. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so he, he gets up and he follows Jesus. Uh, verse 10. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, uh, do we know whose house this is that Jesus is reclining at? Yes, know. how do we know that? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, just simply by looking at the other Gospels. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. And so we can look at Mark chapter 2, verse 15. It's the same story. And we can look at Luke chapter 6, verse 29. 
And we can see that this house that Jesus is, is at, it is Matthew's house, it is Levi's house. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when we look at Luke chapter 6, verse 29, we see that Matthew has actually invited all of his tax collector friends and his sinner friends, and they have come in response to Matthew's invitation. Matthew is holding a banquet in honor of Jesus, who has called Matthew to follow him, which is kind of cool. Uh, here we see in verse 10 in Matthew's gospel, chapter 9, that uh, sinners and tax collectors are sort of on the same level society. It's always sinners and tax collectors, or tax collectors and sinners. It's like the same category of people. And so that's how we know in this passage that tax collectors were seen as unclean and, and breakers of the of the law of God, rebels against God, traitors, someone said. Uh, and so we know that tax collectors were really viewed this way because they're always equated with sinners. It's always tax collectors and sinners, sinners and tax collectors. And Matthew throws this banquet for Jesus. So Jesus goes with Matthew to Matthew's house. He's reclining with Matthew, and Matthew has invited all of his friends. And while they're reclining there, all of the friends, other tax collectors and sinners, come and they recline with Jesus and Jesus' disciples. And apparently they're, they're just having a good time. This is a, this is a banquet. Uh, does, this, does this strike anybody as interesting or odd or just really, really, really cool? Well, wouldn't he want to? Wouldn't he want to bring other people to see him? Hmm. Would he be? Would it have been the reason that he had them come? Could be. Yeah. Now I we don't, don't know. Now we don't know the reason, right? Uh, it could be. The scripture doesn't give us a reason. Like Matthew wanted all of his friends to hear the gospel from right. Jesus. We don't right. have that in the scriptures. Yeah. Now we can guess that that might have been on Matthew's mind. Uh, it could have just been the custom, oh, right? That's true, too, uh, yeah. People here honor people by having them over for dinner, by having banquets. Uh, people will celebrate by having house parties or other kinds of, of parties and celebration. Uh, and so, I mean, the motivation could be anything. Uh, I don't think we know from the scriptures. Um, but it is cool that Matthew goes, yes, I'll follow you. Let's go to my house, <laughs> recline at the table, and I'll invite all my sinful buddies, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting because this is a rabbi, and uh, normally people would think, oh, here is this religious guy who's teaching the law and who said, I'm going to uphold the law. Um, so maybe it's not such a great idea for me to get all my sinner friends into a house with these guys. What will they think of me? You know, that's what people might think today. Mm -hmm. I don't want... I don't want the pastor of the church to come to my party because there's going to be some stuff that he's, oh, yeah. he's going to look down his nose at us. People really think that kind of stuff. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, so yeah, Jesus intentionally goes to the to the worst of sinners, and he and he has a banquet with the worst of of sinners, right? And Jesus stays at this banquet. He's he's having a good time at this banquet with just really sinful people. Um, if we are to strive for Christ's likeness or if we want to be like Jesus, how does this speak to the way that we live? I mean, this speaks, this speaks deeply into the way that we live. It means much for the way we interact with people who are not church people. Uh, and I find this very encouraging because it means I don't have to go be around people and hate them because of what they're doing. <laughs> you know, it's just, this is great. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, so it just it just means much. This is how we how we live like Christ. Mm. Verse eleven. Uh, so we've seen Jesus calls sinners in verses nine and ten. In verse eleven, we see that Jesus uh, does not call the self righteous. When the Pharisees saw this, the religious people and the people who stood for the law and upheld the law and strove throughout their lives to understand the law so that they could teach the law. And these guys, these guys know their stuff, right? In society and culture, they're seen as the, as the spiritual gurus of the day. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his, Jesus' disciples, why is your te teacher eating with the tax collectors and 
sinners. Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? In the mind of the Pharisee, Jesus, by hanging out with people who are ritually unclean, who are rebellious according to the law, he is himself becoming ritually unclean, which we've already seen in Matthew's gospel, right? He touched a leper and became ritually unclean. This, that's the gospel. Jesus takes our sin. Our sin is imputed to Jesus, and his righteousness is imputed to us. This is the very thing he came to do. This is what the Old Testament said that he would do. But in the mind of the Pharisee, the mind of the religious person, we get this way too, so let's not you know, condemn the Pharisee for being this way, because we do get this way. But in the mind of the Pharisee, Jesus is hanging out with that kind of person, someone who is ritually unclean, and he's becoming ritually unclean. And just a few chapters before this, this guy said that he is upholding the law, that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it and to preach it and to explain us. And then he told us that we were wrong about what we taught about the law. And then here he is hanging out with all of these sinful people at this banquet doing who knows what, right? The text doesn't tell us what they're doing or what they're eating or what they're drinking. But, but the Pharisees are like, how can he sit and dine and drink with those people? This is scandalous in this day and time. And, uh, and Jesus does it anyway, right? And he's not worried about his reputation. He's just worried about doing what he came to do. And so in verse 11, and we'll see Jesus say this explicitly in verses 12 and 13 too, uh, he, he came to call the unrighteous, not the righteous. And he'll say, I did not come to call the unrighteous, or the righteous, but the unrighteous. And so we've seen him, we've seen both of those things here. He eats with the sinners, he eats with those who are obviously unrighteous and breaking the law. He calls Matthew, who is unrighteous, who is breaking the law. And he he's not eating or hanging out with the Pharisee, who is self-righteous, who is the one who, who claims to be keeping the law, at least ritually. Uh, do you guys want to point out anything else before we move to verses 12 and 13? And that's actually where we will spend the, the bulk of our time tonight. All right, verses 12 and 13. Are you ready? When I was preparing for tonight, I was thinking, oh no, I'm going to have to teach 9 through 11 and then wait till next week to do 12 and 13 because 12 and 13, <laughs> it's like Jesus is explicit doctrine and we're going to have to go to the Old Testament. We're going to look at Hosea, the prophet Hosea, and we're going to do all of this, all of this great stuff. And so I almost, like I almost had the length that I needed just preparing 12 and 13. And then I looked at the rest of it and I was like, oh yeah, that's just setting us up for 12 and 13. Good deal. So uh, I'm excited about 12 and 13. I hope you guys are excited too, because here God, Jesus, God, Jesus, Jesus is God, uh, tells us the desire that the Father has, the Father's desire, and it's explicit here in this text. Well, when Jesus says, go and learn what the prophet Hosea said, um, it's explicit there. So we get to go and we get to learn that. Um, but first things first, verse 12. But when Jesus heard this, what the Pharisees said, uh, again, they're talking to Jesus' disciples. They're not talking to Jesus himself. So they're asking Jesus' disciples, why does this man eat with sinners and tax collectors? Jesus when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Now, this is an illustration. Um, we know what an illustration is. We'll use an illustration to help explain something, right? And so Jesus compares himself to a physician. And the reason a, a physician visits someone is not because they're well, right? The reason a, physi a physician visits or the reason you visit a physician is so that you can get well because there's something wrong and you need some help and you need to get well. This is the reason Christ said he came and this is the reason Christ said he's hanging out with sinners and with tax collectors because, because they are sinners and this is the whole reason the Messiah comes is to restore sinners, to make sinners well, to make sick people well. And so he opens up with this illustration. It is not the healthy who need a physician, but those who are who are sick. And then in verse 13, Jesus um, uses this illustration to lead into, go and check this out explicitly. 
in the law. So again, we see Jesus referring to the explicit law, uh, quoting the explicit law, telling people to learn what the Old Testament teaches. Jesus' entire preaching and teaching ministry was just explaining the Old Testament, which is really, really cool to think about. Um, He wasn't expanding it. He was always explaining it. And in verse 13, he says, But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Uh, who knows where that verse is found? I've already, I already said the name of the prophet. Hosea, Hosea. 6, 6. Yes, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. So let's turn there together. And uh, we're actually just going to exposit uh, almost the whole book of Hosea because we have to do that to get the context here. Um, but Jesus, he, he instructs the Pharisees who are... Who are, it's like an accusatory question. It's one of those questions that doesn't have a question mark on the end. It has an exclamation point. Mm-hmm. Why is he eating with sinners and with tax collectors? And Jesus quotes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Uh, he does not explain the text, uh, which is very interesting to me. He tells those who study the law to go and study the law because they need to learn what this passage means. Go look at this again, Pharisees. Did you forget about Hosea? Uh, so go look at Hosea. So we're just going to to look at this, look at this together. Um, Hosea chapter six. Somebody please read verses four through six, and we'll talk about that briefly. Before we jump in and kind of do, it, we're just going to do a brief exposition. We're not going to go in and exegete it in detail because we don't have time to do that together. Um, but notice when Jesus, you know, replies to the to the Pharisees, he says, "Go and learn what this passage of Scripture means. What this verse of Scripture means. How many meanings does Isaiah or Hosea chapter six verse six have? If Jesus says, "Go and learn what this means," how many meanings can it possibly have? It's not a whole lot. I mean, it's no." pretty obvious yeah, it's going to have one meaning mm-hmm. here's what i learned and just in jesus remark how he replies to the pharisees in in matthew chapter 9 right if he tells the pharisees go and learn what this means that means scripture as it is given god's inspired word his holy word has a single meaning passages have a single meaning right and it's not like you can look at the bible and point to a verse and read it and say I feel like this means this, or this means, or this means this to me, and everybody can have their own meaning of scripture, right? If Jesus is telling the Pharisees, "Look, go and learn what this verse means," that means there is a very specific and pointed meaning of the text, a meaning that God intends when He inspires the text, and it's God's superintendence that does that, right? Uh, and so, when we read the scriptures, our our agenda shouldn't be let me figure out what this means to me it should be just let me i want to learn what this means maybe it can apply in a few different ways right maybe there are several ways to apply a text but a text only has one single meaning and so we always want to be trying to get at that and that's what we want to do with hosea here now in verse six if we just look at verse six for i delight and the nasb says loyalty here um, if I, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And Jesus' quotation in Matthew chapter 9 says this in verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Uh, there seems to be a, Jesus seems to be saying something just a little bit different than Hosea chapter 6 does. Um, and that difference is Jesus refers to compassion or mercy, whereas Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, talks about obedience, steadfast love, loyalty toward God. Um, Does this difference strike anyone as odd? Like Jesus is quoting the Old Testament, yet the language is a little bit different. Why do you think the language would be a little bit different? So if in the Hebrew, you know, Hosea is saying... Loyalty. King James says mercy, and the NLT said mercy too, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, is Jesus reading from the King James? <laughs> King James and Corinthians sixteen eleven. No, uh, no. Here is what's here is what's going on here, and this is why I said 
translations will come up later. In, but we're here. It's no longer a teaser. We're here. We're at this point in the lesson. Um, yeah, so here's what's happening. In, in Matthew, uh, the Greek is elios, uh, which means mercy. That's the Greek word for mercy. That's the only way that word could be translated is, is mercy. In the Old Testament, in Hosea, in the Hebrew, in the autographical language, the original language, uh, the word is chesed, which means, which means loyalty. It means obedience. And very, very few times it is, it is used to refer to mercy. Now, when the translators of the Greek Septuagint, you know, before Christ was born in the, in the 300s to, you know, 0 AD, and the Septuagint was starting to be translated, starting to be developed, and this started in Egypt, which is really cool to think about. Septuagint translation started in Egypt, and they were translating the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek so that people could read it. They used the Greek word Elias, which is the word Jesus is using in Matthew. So here we have an instance in which Jesus is quoting directly from the Septuagint and not from the Hebrew Bible. Jesus is using a translation and not the autographical text. Does that strike anybody as interesting? Mm -hmm. um, how does that, I mean, does that speak to our use of translations today? And that Septuagint, it's, it's not even like the most accurate translation of the Hebrew text. There are things in the Septuagint that are just a little bit off. Good scholarship for the time, right? But you know, things are just a little bit off, and the Greek language doesn't match the Hebrew language exactly, so you have to play with words, just like when you translate from the Hebrew into English. Sometimes we see things, and we're like, what? And we have to go back to the Hebrew to figure out all the different connotations, and we have to study the culture and the history and what's going on at the time and, and what phrases mean because they don't just translate into English. Uh, the same thing's going on, and we see Jesus using... A Septuagint rather than the original, you know, the Hebrew Bible rather than the autographical text and quoting from it, which is very, very interesting. At least when Matthew quotes Jesus, he quotes Jesus as quoting from the Septuagint because he's writing in Greek, right? Uh, so um, does this give us biblical authority to study from translations or to read from translations or to use translations of scripture rather than always having to go back and use the Hebrew and sure. Greek. And I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it also means that even translations that aren't as precise in language, the NASB is the most precise translation that we have available today. But this means that even translations that aren't as precise as we would like them to be still qualify as as authoritative and and from God according to God's providence. Now, the the only thing I would say on that is, don't use a translation that's obviously bad and mistranslated, right? Like the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Don't yeah. don't have anything to do with that one, right? So in Hosea, in verse six, for I delight in loyalty, chesed in the Hebrew, rather than sacrifice. Um, what? What does this mean in the context of verses 4 through 6? Really, in all of Hosea, but we don't have time to read all of Hosea. What we have right here is verses 4 through 6. What does it mean that God delights in or desires loyalty rather than sacrifice, or obedience rather than sacrifice? And we're, talking, we're looking at the Hebrew here. So, and then we'll talk about how that translates into the Greek and Jesus' use of Elias. So the whole reason you have a sacrificial system is because people are disobedient and here, Hosea is saying, God desires obedience rather than sacrifice. And it's like we look at verses 4 through 6 here. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like a dew which goes away early. Your obedience is so fleeting. You willfully live in your sin and then you use the sacrificial system that I gave to become ritually pure again so that you have an excuse to continue living in sin. And this sounds like some things we do in religion today, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like and been doing for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Yeah, like confession. Yeah, she's going to yeah. say confession. Like penance. Because yeah. I had a friend like, that said that. Hey, I yeah. confess so I can go and do again. This is what we see in verses 4 through 6. Now, in 
Hosea's prophecy, um, the word here, um, chesed, can in a few instances be translated as mercy. And the reason in Hosea's prophecy that most translators will translate it as loyalty or obedience from the Hebrew is because we look at context clues. It doesn't make sense that God would say, for because of or in reference to your sin and your inability to keep the law and your constant transgression of my law, my desire is for you to have mercy toward me concerning my law. It just That doesn't make sense for God mm-hmm. to say. And so they'll say loyalty. My desire is for you to be obedient to me yes. concerning my law, to be loyal to me concerning my mm-hmm. law. And so the right. translators here translate this as, as loyalty uh, rather than mercy. Mm-hmm. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. You are sinners. You're willfully living in sin. My desire is that you become obedient to my law and so glorify me and honor me. And through the prophet Hosea, and this is where we're going to walk through just a little bit, um, and actually we won't read, I'll just kind of summarize, but here from chapter 6 through chapter 7, through chapter 8, through chapter 9, and you can see some of the headings if your Bible has headings, through chapter 9, uh, through chapter 10, through chapter 11, through chapter 12, and through chapter 13, God continues to use this language concerning the southern nation, Judah. And it's like, I am your God, I am your Lord, and you are rebelling against me, and you're just using religion to stay ritually pure, and I, that does not please me. And then we get to chapter 14. I want you guys to hear how amazing this is when we get to chapter 14 because obviously God is angry. And that, that's several chapters there where God is speaking from his anger and from his wrath and, and from his just nature. And then we get to chapter 14. And God, God has already said in a couple of the previous chapters, I will n- not punish you in my anger, which is really amazing. We get to chapter 14. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. There God is offering just forgiveness. Like, what kind of grace is this? That God would say, you've done all this, you are living in rebellion against me, and I hate your sacrifices. I would rather you just be obedient, but I'm not going to let my anger burn against you in punishment. Instead, return to me and I will forgive your sin, and I will receive you graciously. All you have to do is turn and ask. That's amazing. And in chapter 14, we get down to verses 8 and 9. We see, oh, Ephraim, what more have I to do with... Idols, And this is where we see the fruit, right? It's after forgiveness is granted and after God turns his people back to him himself and after he, he takes away all iniquity. O oh, Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like a luxuriant cypress. From me comes your fruit. From whom comes the fruit? God. Yeah, it's not people working for to merit salvation. It's not people working to achieve these things. We can't give enough sacrifices in order to be right with God. We can't do this, and we've proven that we can't keep the law. And so God says, I will, I will be the source of the fruit that you bear since you can't be that source. This, this is just the gospel, right? And we see this in the prophet Hosea. This is the Old Testament message, which sounds a lot like the New Testament message. In verse 9, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them. According to the prophet Hosea, how how does one come to dwell in righteousness? How does one fit into this category? Simply by being forgiven of God, God taking away all iniquity, God becoming the source of a person's fruit, not the person becoming the source of that fruit. The righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. In Hosea, God is talking about his law through the prophet 
Hosea. And so the way that the law connects to gospel is actually quite beautiful here. It's not keep the law and so be saved. It's be saved and so keep the law, which is very interesting connections. It comes as a result of God's forgiveness, God's transforming of the heart, the regeneration of the heart, God's turning of our heart, clothing us in his own righteousness, and he becomes the source of of the fruit that we produce, this fruit that we bear as Christians in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, and the righteous, those who have this new righteous nature, in the New Testament we learn that that's in Christ, right? Those who have this new righteous nature in Christ will walk in them, referring to, referring to the words of the law, the ways of the Lord. But the transgressors, those who have this sinful, unrighteous nature, even if they try to keep the law, will stumble in that it will be a burden on them. It will weigh upon them. And that's why I ask the first question here. Is the law a burden or a pleasure for you? Those who are actually transformed by Christ, who are really, truly transformed by Christ, desire to look to God's good law and obey God. And obey God. It becomes a yearning within our spirits. God, I want to come into a greater obedience to you. So it's not a works-based righteousness. It's righteousness-based work. And it's what we want to do. We gain a desire to do it. And so it's just part of our nature. I want to be a good son to the Father. Or ladies, I want to be a good daughter to the Father who is in heaven. I just want to please Dad is what that becomes. And so I, I want to do what honors what honors God. But transgressors, those who don't have this new nature, a regenerate heart, who are not in Christ, they'll try and be religious, they'll try and keep the law, but the law actually becomes a stumbling block to them, and it weighs a lot, and to people who don't really know Christ, who aren't in Christ, it just feels like religion is all these rules and regulations, and I can't do this, and we hear people describe it in that way, it's because you're lost, and you don't have... You don't have a nature that can do this. Not joy, right? but discouragement. Yeah, mm-hmm. not joy, but discouragement. That's actually the right. So that's what's going on in in Hosea. And so when Christ quotes this and gives this to gives this to the Pharisees, he's like, Pharisees, go learn this. In the Pharisees' mind, it's righteousness, the works of righteousness that merited salvation. And so Jesus is saying, No, go learn what this means. Go study the prophet Hosea. Hosea says. You can't do this. You've transgressed God's law, but God, by mercy and by grace, saves the people for himself, forgives their sin, regenerates the heart, and gives people the desire, the yearning to obey his law. To obey his law. Um, and so, and so that's, what, that's what we want to learn as, as well. And the reason Jesus, you know, he quotes the Septuagint, and the Septuagint uses the word Mercy, which is not a, a mistranslation, it's just not as precise as the Hebrew language is, right? So it's not a mistranslation, otherwise Jesus wouldn't quote it. But when he refers to mercy, we see where that mercy is, and it's not in it's not in the way that people treat God, or some commentators will say that that's the way that the Pharisees should have been treating the sinners and the tax collectors there, which which maybe makes a little bit of sense, but in light of Hosea's prophecy, it's obviously the way people are acting toward God, but we read through Isaiah's prophecy, and it's, it's God having mercy toward people, particularly toward his people. And that, I think, is what Jesus was getting at, and why he purposefully you know, quotes from the, from the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was the popular translation in, in the Greek-speaking nation, uh, even though Jesus did not always speak Greek. So for the Christian... Walking in the ways of God's law is a joy and a privilege. It's, it's, not, a, it's not this heavy burden that we have to bear and I have to, and I have to force myself to do this, this, this. And this. No, it's just I want to do this. For, as, as an example, right, um, Katie and I went on vacation. Of course, that's obvious. We were gone for a whole week. Uh, <laughs> um, but before vacation, I read in Deuteronomy chapter 14 where the law actually instructs the people of God to go on vacation. and instructs them on, on how to go on vacation and, and how to save up for vacation. And I read that and I was like, well, dang, I've been doing vacation wrong. And, some, and something in me wanted to change the way that we 
do vacation as a family. Not because, oh, I have to do this and it's this heavy burden and if we don't do it this way, then we're not honoring God. It's just because, oh, that's God's design. And oh, there was this desire in me. I want to do this now. I want to change the way that I do things now. And that's the Christian's response. It's a joy and a privilege. We desire to be obedient children. For the one who will not enter the kingdom of heaven, the law is a stumbling block that feels like nothing but weighty rules. So for any preacher or teacher to say that the law is abolished, I brought this up at the beginning, right? Use this example, what I've heard so many times. For any preacher or teacher to say that the law is abolished and no longer carries any validity for believers is for him or her to actually disagree with Jesus. And again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 I did not come to abolish the law. That's what Jesus said. This shows that this preacher or teacher um, who says the law is abolished, and you know, any form of language, there are several different ways people say that, but to say that the law is abolished um, shows that we do not have a heart that has, that has been given by Jesus because if Jesus is regenerating the heart, we have this new heart. It becomes our desire to become more obedient to to the law. Uh, those who are redeemed actually care about obeying Christ. And this is why Jesus said uh, something to the effect of, and this is in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus did not say, you can only get into the kingdom of heaven by keeping my commandments. That's not what Jesus said, right? Jesus' message was the opposite of, of that. Love is the root obedience is the fruit if all scripture is breathed by jesus we believe that jesus is god and we see in isaiah chapter 48 verse 16 that isaiah identifies jesus christ not by name but he identifies jesus the second person of the trinity as the one who speaks all of the old testament scriptures which is really kind of amazing everything through the prophets everything that's written in the law was spoken directly by by Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And Isaiah chapter 48 identifies Jesus as the one who does this. The fruit growing out of love that we have for Christ is obedience not just to what Jesus says in the red letters in the New Testament. Our desire is to be obedient to all of Scripture. That means everything in the law and everything in the prophets and everything in the writings and everything in the gospels and everything in the letters and everything in the New Testament Literature, which is not something that a lot of people want to say because there are, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. You know, we get to a passage of scripture like, and I'll just kind of go through this because we don't have much time. Um, Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 14, where Paul is writing to the church in Galatia and he says, we are no longer under the curse of the law. And people will take that and use it to mean all sorts of things about the law. What do you think Paul is referring to in Galatians chapter 3 when he says something like we are no longer under the curse of the law? If the law is obviously still important and Jesus is submitting himself to the law and according to the law, those changed by God care about obeying the law and the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, if you love me and love is the, the root, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments, which is all of scripture, then what might Paul mean when he says something like we are no longer under the curse of the law? To be under the law means that we are judged by the law. It's pointing out everything that's wrong, right? That's to be under the law, under the curse of the law. There's a difference between being under the law and in Christ while pursuing obedience to Christ. There's just a difference there. It doesn't mean the law is not important or the law is abolished. It just means the law is no longer condemning me. Right, uh, so what Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 14 means is that we uh, are under the curse of the law if we are trying to merit salvation or become righteous by keeping the law. The law is a stumbling block for us. When we get to Galatians 5, this is in Galatians, right? It's good to look at context, good to look at the whole book, good to not just stop at one passage of Scripture, but to know where the argument is going. When we get to Galatians chapter 5, we see that the regeneration of the heart and salvation produces the fruit of the Spirit, and 
we become dead to our trespasses and sins as a result of the Spirit producing fruit in our lives. This means that we are becoming obedient to the law out of love and life, no longer being under the curse of the law, but being in Christ and desiring to be obedient to Him. This means that there is no law against our new nature, and Paul says that explicitly in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. Uh, do we see how important it is to look at context before drawing conclusions about what a certain passage of Scripture means? Because we could just look at Galatians chapter 3 by itself, verses 10 through 14 around there, and say, oh, well, it's not important for me to even think about the law or to know what the law says or to know what honors God because I'm no longer under the law. I'm in grace. I'm free to do whatever. But then you get to Galatians chapter 5, and Paul actually writes, it's not the law that saves. When you become a new person and the Holy Spirit comes in and starts producing fruit in your life, the Holy Spirit starts conforming you to the image of Christ and your nature becomes that which actually pursues and desires the law of God and obedience to Jesus Christ, uh, which is really, really cool to think about. We've, we've got to look at the Bible in context. <laughs> That's context, context, context. We'll probably say that every time we get together. We arrive at Jesus Last statement in this passage to the Pharisees. For I did not come, for it could also be because, because I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And so Jesus took the time to tell the Pharisees, go learn Hosea. It's going to explain to you the reason I am hanging out with sinners and with tax collectors and being with them and showing grace and mercy toward them, and then he answers their question, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? Because I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that's the doctrinal statement. I did not come to call the righteous, but, but sinners. Christ came to call sinners. Christ came to give sinners a new heart. And it is those called sinners who will, through sanctification, become willfully, passionately, and joyfully obedient to God in every respect. Uh, this is the work that God is doing. Uh, the law is still as valid and as applicable as it was in the Old Testament times. It hasn't changed. God doesn't change, right? Uh, not one letter has passed away. The law serves the same purpose to point out our sin. And then uh, for the Christian, for the one who knows Christ as, as a point of sanctification, as we read the law, it changes us. Uh, serves the same purpose, and the law accomplishes the same work that it did in the Old Testament. Yeah.